everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, I'm Linda Goodfriend. Uh, I don't know any actors in the house. Yay, 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 actors. Um, so um, I am the creative director of the acting department. And, um, you know, this is, I, I have to be very excited because this is our first in-person event in two and a half years. So, um, and we have very special guests tonight. Don't blow it. Okay. It's, uh, <laughs> Um, so I am going to introduce them, but um, I want to find out first who who here is from screenwriting. Any screenwriters over there? I have my acting contingent here. Filmmakers, filmmakers, uh, producers. You produce, oh wow, a lot of producers. Good. Okay. Uh, you came to see Tom Cruise and Top Gun. Anybody? No. Okay. Wrong place. All right. So um, we're going to start. I want to. They said make it brief, but I'm going to make it lengthy. I'm going to introduce <laughs> our guests tonight: um, Matteo Borghese and Rob Trabowski. And uh, just saying that was really difficult. So that that's hard. So um, Matteo and Rob, they have been partners for ten years. Uh, they're currently writers and co-executive producers on the Hulu series Only Murders in the Building. If you haven't seen it, look at this. We have a fan uh, starring Steve Martin, Martin Short, uh, Selena Gomez. It's a wonderful series. Um, it is starting their second, sem uh, second semester. I'm in school. I think you call it seasons, right? Um, their second season, June. Oh, I don't know. Do you know when? The end of June. End of June. 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 June 28th. June 28th. <laughs> Do you have an agent here? June okay. 28th. Um, Two weeks. Yeah. In a couple weeks, and uh, they are starting to write on the third season. So uh, we do. We'll have a third season. Just to let you know that secret. Um, they've also uh, they have additional credits, including Silicon Valley, Lady Dynamite, Black Monday, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and The Detroiters. Um, they've developed original. Uh, pilots for Comedy Central, TBS, ABC, and Fox. In film, they have contributed to the scripts for Spider-Man, in, Into the Spider-Verse, Ghostbusters, Office Christmas Party, The Penis Movie, and this is a hard one, Barat Subsequent Movie Film, among yeah. others. Um, their feature film, False Alarm, was developed at Universal with Paul Figg, attached to direct. They've been writing partners since they graduated uh, from USC. Both of them received an MFA in screenwriting. Um, they're both WGA and PGA Award nominees, Writers Guild and Producers Guild. Um, and one fun fact is um, Hollywood Reporter uh, hailed them as the go-to guys for punch-up. So when Phil Lord, Chris Miller, or Paul Figg needs a script to be funnier, this is who they go to. Let me just ask you, was that a lot of pressure? It was a lot of, it almost, it, I mean, if I, if I, hearing that, it, <laughs> just hearing it has it almost no effect on me. No, yeah. I think what they ask you to do is um, to write, uh, to punch up a scene from A Star is Born and make it funny. That was our idea. Oh, that yeah. was your idea. I think. Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't, they no, had, they I don't had know other ideas. Well, I don't remember. Nobody's seen it. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. So, um, so let's start with, you know, you. We have some writers here, producers here. Um, you were where they were about ten years ago, um, and um, I mean, you weren't here. You were mm -hmm. USC there, but uh, you've done a lot of work since then. So, how did you get from here to there? What was your journey? What, you know, and I think probably, I mean, I talk to actors a lot, and the main question is always, how do I get started? I've just graduated, I have a degree, how do I get started? How did you all get started? Well, I guess after we graduated USC, the first step was to completely bottom out morale wise, <laughs> mm -hmm. to just absolutely feel like you're never gonna accomplish anything, <laughs> that you're gonna move home and your parents are never gonna let you forget your like misadventure in Los Angeles. And you sit in that for like six months. <laughs> and then after that, after like six months, your soon to be wife says, like you need to do something about this. And you email your friend Rob Trabofsky and you say, are you working on anything? Would you like to write a script with me? Mm -hmm. And that's where the rocket ride takes yeah, off. Just get my email, and uh, you know, you too could have 
this many bottles of water. <laughs> uh, we, yes, we, uh, you know, so w that happened. We were, um, I was working as an assistant uh, for Judd Apatow. I'd been an intern there during grad school. And um, that we wrote, uh, um, I think the first thing we wrote maybe was a feature script together, right? I yeah. think. And just to sort of see if we could do it. And then we wrote a pilot. Um, and, and from that, I think we were able to get a, a manager and maybe an agent from, from that pilot. But um, we, we were very lucky. I mean, you know. And, and so from that pilot, then we got hired on the first season of Silicon Valley. Did you all write on your own before you became partners? Or when you met in, you met in school, were you writing together at that time where you just knew each other and just and were writing on your own before that? Um, well, <clears throat> at USC, they, they weren't too hot on the idea of collaborating on scripts, which seems um, interesting given that's basically all we do now. Um, so we mostly were writing by ourselves, um, but we knew each other and we read each other's work and all that kind of work. Mm -hmm. our, our, uh, stupid goof scripts uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, and th enjoyed them. I think it was, you know, you find someone who has a similar sensibility maybe and uh, wants to work as few hours as you do. <laughs> That's the key. Uh, um, but, but yeah, we had each written a lot before actually. It's kind of, you know, at USC we wrote, I think everybody wrote like three features, I think, wow. and, and, and a couple of, maybe one pilot and a spec episode of another show, depending on what you did. So, so we, you know, we'd each written a fair amount of scripts mm -hmm. before, and uh, I think we each looked at our own work and was like, this isn't going <laughs> to... <laughs> <laughs> this is not going to fly. This is not going to do it. Yeah. It, it should be said also, like, before we even got to school, we were, I, I'd, you know, um, I've been on a sketch team at the UCB, or had a sketch group, and we performed at the UCB, for five years and, you know, had done a bunch of other stuff uh, kind of leading up to school. And you were doing stand-up mm -hmm. um, in Boston. So it's not like um, we were completely fresh when we got to school even. Like, I feel like we knew some people and, and had worked or at least tried to get things off the ground beforehand. Do you feel like your, your, your classes in your master's program helped you mm. kind of formulate a plan or or be more solid in terms of scripts because you said you were both you were doing stand-up you were doing some improv do you feel like it helped you structure more I think like the the maybe the best lesson was just like you got to do it <laughs> you got to sit there and do it and it's like it's very stressful and you'll feel that it's terrible and it might be terrible, but you just gotta finish. And that was the most helpful lesson. And then, you know, I think there's still some like structural ideas that we've kept from school, but they're very basic. Like, and I don't think any lesson really sticks with you or is more applicable than this should be entertaining and not boring, <laughs> you know? Right. Do you have a brand? Do you have a style that you, you feel you, you go for, boy. Right. <laughs> we're, we're trying to get away from that style. <laughs> <laughs> Unproducible. <laughs> I I find you know for a while what would attract us were I I mean you just try to figure out what are you interested in you know and like what strikes you as funny and that becomes your brand I think in our case at least it's like and that tends to be stuff that other people aren't writing about for whatever reason because those are our interests are very narrow and stupid. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I also think people approach, have all kinds of approaches and some are way more pragmatic than that. But what's our, what's our brand? What was the thing that like they said about Monty Python? Like if you were stupid, you thought Monty Python was funny and if you were smart, you thought it was really funny. I like that, but not as good <laughs> as, as, the, as the aim. So, so when you, You've written right now. Let's talk about the show. So you're on your you're on your second season. I mean, you're going into your third se season writing it. Um, how does the writers' room work? Um, well, I mean, on this show, because I think you guys have heard of the writers' room, right? You know, the writers' room. How who decides? First of all, who decides who is in the writers' room? 
I think that's a really good question because it's it's very complicated and um, it's not immediately obvious and it takes you a long time before you kind of get a grip on how these decisions are made. But it's not just the showrunner. Obviously, the showrunner is like a huge voice in who's staffed on the show. But you know, the network chimes in. There are producers, and you know, there are different kind of things that different priorities people have for how to staff the room, who should be in the room, whose voice should like we need to hear from in the show, and um, you know, uh, so uh, like a lot of things, it's a decision that a lot of people have a voice in. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's it was some it's something that's always baffled us in trying to staff on shows. It's always like a black box of like, you know, like, do you have a mutual friend, and does your you know, do you have a sample that is somehow connected to the show, you know? And it's all these kinds of things that are sort of luck, in a way. Um, this one, you know, this guy, this John Hoffman is the name of the guy who runs the show, who created it with Steve Martin. You know, we had a meeting with John, or Zoom with John, and uh, one of the other producers who we had met with generally years and years ago, who claims he remembered us, I don't know what to say, but, you know, in, in that case, it was like, we sort of, we had written uh, something that was in the mystery space, or something that was like tonally, like had some drama to it, so they're like, okay, they can kind of do that, and we... Really, I think the main thing is like we genuinely loved the pilot script and we loved Stephen and, and Marty. Uh, Selena Gomez wasn't in it at that point. And I think, you know, enthusiasm goes a long way because we've definitely had meetings on shows where we're like, uh, we'll work on this. <laughs> like, we're lucky, <laughs> we're lucky to work. Now our attitude would be like, we're lucky to work. But if you don't, even if you go in it with that, that's good. that reads differently than I love, you know, I would die to work on this show or whatever. Yeah, I think it's like the pilot script had already been written for the show and we had read it like Rob was saying and, um, you know, we could identify pretty clearly where, what they were going for, how it related to, you know, it's a very like star driven show clearly, how it related to each kind of character and each of the, you know, actors playing those characters and what we like about them and what we remember from their work or what we'd like to see from them. And so we were like just very excited as fans to talk about that kind of stuff. Yeah, a lot of those meetings are like, you know, you're demonstrating like, do you want to work on the show? How much do you want to work on the show? And are the ideas that you have for the show, like, in, do they demonstrate that you get the show? You know, so like, if we had pitched like, yeah, maybe a cool thing in episode two would be like, they murder each other. And then we're like, well, you don't seem to get, you know, that probably is not gonna work <laughs> in the show, whatever. You have, you you know. have no show, but right. other than that, yeah. So. Let's hold on to that one yeah, for yeah, it could be <laughs> season, season three. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's, I think, what we, you know, we talk about what we love about those guys and how the characters reflect that, but do something a little different, you know. Did they know you from reputation or did you have to submit materials? Um, or say, hey, write an episode, a sample episode that would work with this pilot? What was the process? So, I think almost, I've never actually even heard of a show that is uh, looking at specs, especially not specs of the show that you're applying for anymore. It's mostly original material that they want to see from you, your, your pilot, or we have some novelists and some playwrights on our staff right now, and I'm sure that was what they looked at. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, it's a conversation that hopefully you have with your agent or your manager where they're like, you know, this show is looking and we're going to send them this. And you're like, well, I don't know, maybe send them this, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know? Uh, so you you read the, the pilot and you try and decide, like, like we were saying before, like what way you connect to it and what of your material kind of would speak to that, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do, they, do, do they plan the entire series, all the, basically, this, with this is a little different because it has to have a finite ending. Somebody dies and somebody has to figure out who murdered that person. Right, right. But is, is there, are there specific episodes before you even start with the season, before you start the writer's room, and then you're writing each episode? Or 
do they just have a basic storyline that you go with? Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> no, I think it, it depends on what show you're working on. This show, I think we had a light. I don't. I think the showrunner, well, John wanted to hear what everybody had to say before we even jumped into what else would happen. He had this pilot. Everybody had read the pilot. What happens next? That was the we first question. We didn't have question. the killer. Yeah, like the idea of who the killer would be uh, came later. You know, right? It mm -hmm. came like a couple weeks in or something about who it would be and what their relationship would be and a lot of that backstory stuff. I mean, he had a lot of that. A lot of that was in the pilot, but. I think it definitely changed based on, and you know, one thing was like people would come in with like, you know, stories of, you know, family secrets or, you know, you talk about like growing up in New York and like those kinds of buildings and things like that. And that all, you know, that's what you want, I think, from a writing staff is people who can populate the show with the stuff that makes it feel alive, you know. Do you try to make it funny or is it? <laughs> is it well, is it hope. more about the story <laughs> or is it more about the jokes? Well, I think the jokes have to uh, serve the characters, you know. So there's, you never want to write anything that doesn't sound like something that they would say, even if it's really funny to you. It it's not gonna it does it like sort of like takes you out of the reality of the show, and and the actors are pretty sensitive about that. I think you know they're definitely lines and things where Steve or Marty will be like, you know, this doesn't quite feel like the character, especially as we've done more episodes and they've kind of understood the character more. And that's and those lines are usually ones that Mateo writes. That's right. <laughs> it's my specialty. I can see why you're partners. Uh, so do do Steve and Marty ever write any of their own dialogue or do they in rehearsal do they come up with dialogue or is it strictly they strictly stick to the script with whatever you all have written? Um, on murders like specifically, they they will come in with ideas. They'll come in with uh, pieces that they'd like, just even just like kind of vague concepts that they want in the show, and we'll we'll try and put them in. But it's no guarantee that, you know, as you beat out a mystery, that you can fit that idea into it without moving too many parts. Mm -hmm. So we we try and uh, you know take their um, their suggestions, um, you know, as much as possible. And I think you know they've. They're very considerate about like, <laughs> the script has been worked on a lot, so we're gonna try and do it the way that you know, yeah. you wrote it. And if we can't find a way in our performance to bring out something really great, we might add something or, you know, or if we're feeling like, oh, we can riff on this a little bit. That's not always true. I mean, sometimes you're on a sitcom and there's literally just like a bag of jokes and they're like, here, try this one, try this one, try this one. Yeah. I think they're, they've just like are, you know, obviously great performers and they know, you know, if I stress this word just this way, I think I can get a laugh out of it um, in a way that, you know, takes a lot of practice and, and they put a lot of focus on each line as written. Mm -hmm. So on other shows you've been on, if actors change your dialogue, does that kind of annoy you? <laughs> I don't I'm, I'm, I'm asking for the on the actor's <laughs> point of view because I know there are you know actors who will go in and say oh I'll just change the script and the writers are the producers who are in the casting room and it's like does that annoy writers <laughs> what do you think I'm sure there have been moments on things where you know like when I'm working on this movie office Christmas party holiday classic I'm sure we all have seen it um, <laughs> you know and and our job there was just writing jokes we didn't write this although we did work on the script but mainly we were writing jokes handing them to the actor or the director and they would try a joke and sometimes you would hand something to someone and they would be like ah, I don't want to do this or they would just do something else <laughs> eventually Again, mostly mine. yeah, yeah. <laughs> eventually there you like even then you know at first you're like oh I wish I was dead you know when that happens but then you're like well you know you just got to move on and at the end of the day, it's them on camera saying it, you know, so I get it, you know. If they, if they don't like it, I don't want them to do it, and I'd rather just figure out why they don't like it and, and you know. And if they have, like, you know, a good idea that they want to try out, like, I think, again, there's just so many people involved and they're all adding something, 
Like, it doesn't bother me if they find something really, really fun. I mean, Neil yeah. Casey, when we were working on Other Space, yeah. which is no longer available on... No, it's on... Um, if you go into the Peacock app, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's a channel within that. Are you guys writing this down? Dust or dust? I see pencils. <laughs> and that, yeah. <laughs> so he is a, you know, he was a well-known improviser at the UCB, and yeah, you know, we've worked with a lot of people like this, and they could just kind of, they'll take the line, they'll do the line our way once or twice, and then they'll be like, well, here, how about this? Yeah. And if it's funny, like we're happy to have it in our script, you and, know? Yeah, and then you get, the, get credit the credit for it. Yeah, you your name is on the, the script, and people are like, did you write that? Like, yeah, really? yeah. Improv and also on a show, you know, not every show is this way, but most of the ones we've worked on, your episode is like, it's not like you wrote every word in that episode. You're, you're including ideas from everyone in the room, you know. Uh, people may have pitched jokes at any point that you're putting in, and also the showrunner is going to do their pass on the script, depending on the level of detail and mm -hmm. what they want, how far away you were from their target. So, like, you're all, it's already a group effort, you know. So that makes it easier to be like, yeah, people want to change it, you know. Go for it. Just give me the check. Yeah, give sure. me the paycheck. Yeah. That's not to say, like, for the <laughs> actors out there, there are people who do get upset That's about true. I, I, I don't know if this is, if people are more easygoing or less. I think people definitely want to hear the line. You know, you got, you, it's not a suggestion. You have to try it. You yeah. have to give it a shot. Yeah. It's also like, especially if you're on set, you know, every minute costs, I'm sure somebody could calculate how many tens of thousands of dollars. <laughs> so, like, that's definitely not really the time to be like, let's play, you know, <laughs> unless you have like a really specific understanding and, you know, level of trust and things like that. Yeah. So, so you mentioned about writing jokes and handing them in. So what is your, you, you all are the punch up guys, you punch up films. I mean, that's is according it, to that one article. Well, okay, yeah. that one article said you, you <laughs> are the punch up article. guys to make yeah, yeah. a script funnier, yeah, yeah. no pressure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now that it's been in Hollywood Reporter, everybody right. expects that now. Um, so what is the process for doing that? Do you all go to the set, hand out, write jokes as, they, as they're running the scene? Do you take the script? You give alternate lines? How, what's the process to punching up? It really like depends on who you're working with, but I think it's become more and more a part of writing and more and more uh, a part of movie making. Um, it's just become very standard to have a joke writer on set just in case, you know, this isn't landing. <laughs> in case we need a joke. Yeah, yeah. So there's usually one like very pale, unhappy looking person <laughs> yeah. like hoovering down. Or two who split a, a paycheck. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One with a beard, one yeah. without. Okay. Someone who writes the jokes that anger the actors <laughs> and <laughs> one that pleases them. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... The way, uh, I think a common version of it is just they'll shoot like two of the script and then they'll be like, okay, what do you, what, what, do, what you, do you got? What do you got? Yeah, it's like kind of cigar chomp and, and you no, know, and so you like, you, you've, we often have like sticky pads and they're full of like ideas and we'll hand the ones that aren't, we think aren't garbage to the director mm -hmm. and he will pronounce them garbage <laughs> and maybe pick one or yeah. two, you know, um, and then, you know, he'll run the idea over the actors per DGA rules, I think, <laughs> and then take credit for the idea, yeah. probably. But we've also, we've done it at every stage. We, you know, we've also done it much earlier in the process where some, you know, another thing is like these round tables where they'll get five or six writers for a day. You know, they'll buy you some tender greens and... Um, <laughs> And pay you. But Sometimes the it's greens, Mendocino yeah, Farm. Mendocino is popular. So. Sweet green. Yeah. What am I leaving out? Yeah, no, let's let's stay <laughs> on this the one other one for a places. <laughs> uh, and, and so you will have read the script, and then they'll kind of go through it page by page. Okay, who's got something on page one? All about two. the bread. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> um, Obviously into their meals. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, you'll go, you'll go through it, so you might do it that way, or maybe somebody will just send you the script and, you know, whatever you can do over the weekend, we'll take that, you know. Th those are all different. And okay. then there are more, more um, in-depth kind of like polishes or, you know, a rewrite or something, which would take weeks or months or something. But usually if it's just jokes, 
that's a couple of days. And and generally what happens is, you know, they'll have a script that doesn't really work and they're like, okay, we need a funnier act three, which is not really their problem. Their problem is all kinds of act other two, stuff. But yeah. yeah, but they're like, but we shoot in a week. So, you know, really all we can fix at this point is the dialogue. You know? Yeah, and that's when the tender greens come yeah. out. <laughs> and we've done that. We've also done uh, ADR, which is like when the movie is shot and then there's like addition, you know, ADR is like, whenever you hear an actor say something but the camera's not on their mouth, you know, so like an off-screen line or something, or like an animation, you know, that's all ADR. So we will, we've done plenty of that too, where you're writing to, well, what's something that would match the shape that a mouth is making? Right <laughs> now, <you know>? Yeah, <laughs> um, can we sneak something like extremely funny over this person's shoulder? Yeah. Probably not. Like, yeah, that's yeah. probably not where your best joke very is going to come yeah. with. But sometimes, you know. So you all just did a mini room. Uh -huh. Can you tell us what a mini room is on the show Hacks, right? Right. Your I, competition? Yes. <laughs> Do they know that? Yeah. Well, we like to think it just, we're just, you know, it's like betting on red and black and roulette, you know. Um, well, I think, like, the, the way rooms are structured and the way TV shows are written is constantly kind of being revised because... Like, you know, there's it's no longer a standard order for a season. Like in the network days, they were doing 22, 24 episodes a year, and they were doing it for 30 years, and it got, like, very predictable how the show would be written, and it, you know, there was, there was a certain structure, and now it's, you know, the orders are all over the place when they're shooting versus when you're writing. It's also all over the place. You might write an entire season and then go off and then shoot it, or you could be overlapping. So there's lots of different changes kind of in the way rooms can be structured. Like we've worked on shows where there basically wasn't a room, where they were just like go off and write a script and, you know, see you later. And we've also done things like this where, you know, um, they asked us to come and, think of some ideas for the next season of Hacks, and it was just for a week, and it was very casual, and it was just like, what do you guys think? Yeah, and, and it's a smaller, you know, writer's rooms, I mean, they're all kinds of different sizes, I think. We haven't worked on a network show where the rooms are pretty big, I think, especially if you're doing 20-something episodes. What, what do you consider big? I mean, they have like 15, 20 writers on some yeah. shows, right? Even like two rooms at the same time, I think, on some, like Modern Family had that. And I think uh -huh. The Simpsons maybe has something like that. Um, I mean, Always Sunny, I think, when we worked on it, was a lot of writers, you know, um, Only Murders, we probably have about 12, 10 or 12 or something. Um, this Hacks thing was just, it was much smaller. It was, I think there were three or four, four of us plus the three showrunners. So it's a much smaller group and, you know, it was just kind of, blue sky, like what are things that could happen, what do you think worked, what do you think didn't work. Whenever they ask you what didn't work, uh, it's obviously a Shit. trap. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <you know. laughs> the answer is nothing, I just, I, wish just, it, I just wish there was more of it. Tone down the, the laughs, show. I'm <laughs> laughing too hard. Yeah. It's keeping my neighbors up. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, so you said you started out and you wrote a pilot script, mm -hmm. just you were working for Judd, right, yes. as an intern, yeah. and you wrote a script. Yeah. What did you do with that script? How did how did you get an agent from that? Is that was that how you started? You got an agent through writing a pilot script. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, Glad he knows. It's, it's always like. I think this is a very dated way to have done it. I think like I don't, you know, I don't know how common it is to do it this way versus some other way, but we wrote the script and then, you know. Again, we're just really, you only realize how lucky you are later, but like, uh, because I was at that office and because uh, a friend of Mateo's uh, a wife worked at Comedy Central, we had people who we could send it to who had some, who then when they sent it to an agent or a manager, they'd be inclined to look at it because they had, this is an important person to them. You know, like we've subsequently had friends or people who are like, can you send our script to a, your manager or agent? And sometimes we do it. And you know nothing. It makes it makes no difference. So that that was what did it. And I think um, you know again we just we sort of that's that's what got us a manager and an agent. You know to then get on Silicon Valley was again we got lucky because one they had happened to be editing that pilot uh, in the Apatow office building. He would just 
rent out the second floor to people. So Mike Judge was there, so I kind of knew Mike's assistant a little bit. And he was, for whatever reason, only interested in, like, scripts that came from one comp people repped by one company because he didn't trust the people that his company, some stuff like that or whatever, I don't know. Um, you know, again, just strange coincidences that it happened to work for Mike. But, yeah. And I think it's like Mike is someone who was like extremely successful and all the people who were working with him were extremely successful and they were all doing their own yeah, they were extremely busy. successful yeah, yeah. stuff. And so he did not know any like lowly peons like us. Yes. And so like, you know, there's not a lot of shows are they're just going to staff up their friends or people that they've worked with before. So uh, we definitely got lucky there as well, I think. So so we have who are who are our screenwriters again over here. So we have a contingency over here. So so they've graduated and they want to be in the business. What what's the advice you give them? Um, do they need an agent or manager? Do they need a writing sample? What do you think? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I think you need samples. There you so go. You need material, you know. I think, um, yeah, you have to have material first. I mean. Do you specifically gear it towards, I want to be a television comedy writer, that's what I want, that's what I'm going to write, or do I have a comedy sa sample, a drama, you know, something for TV, do I have a feature film, what do you think? Yeah, if that's a lot you of writing. Like, yeah, <laughs> you can write all those things. Yeah, Go too. ahead. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, uh, sure, I mean, it's good to don't narrow, you know, limit your interests. I mean, in our case, we were just, you know, genuinely interested in comedy. I mean, there have been moments where we were like, I don't think should, we can do it. Like, should we, we have a drama? Think, yeah, you know? I mean, our, you know, we wrote a pilot recently that was like had more dramatic elements which was like a departure for us but it was scary yeah but that was really the idea kind of led us there we didn't start with like let's write a drama i mean i think if you wanted to you know the first thing you need is a sample that's good whether it's a tv script <laughs> or a movie script you know that kind of doesn't matter. Stop writing trash. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't think about the form. Even if you who had like a short judge, story. Who is going to yeah. make that decision on if it's good? Should you, seriously, should you th show, you shouldn't show it to your mom and dad, right? You should, should Probably you show not. it to your friends, your instructors, your, what do you, who do you? 75% of our parents are ESL. So <laughs> like, I think that would not work. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think you like, guys don't have to work. You just sit there and you throw right. around jokes and have a good time. And you no, that does, if only that got it done. <laughs> no, I, I think it's mostly Mendocino farms. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I, I I think like you can only ask so much of your friends for yes. sure. You know, like you can. I think you can ask each friend once <laughs> per script, depending on how many scripts you write a year. You know, like definitely don't ask the same person more than once just because like the most valuable thing to you is somebody's first impression of your work. Hmm. I think there are people that have sent us scripts and like just the volume of scripts made us treat those scripts worse than they <laughs> yeah, deserve. just the rage. It's like another fucking script from this, excuse my language. <laughs> and then like it's a perfectly fine script and you're like, well, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think that's, you, you start with the people you know, that's all you can really do and I, I, because it's not like, I don't think you want to put too much stock in any particular person's taste, mm -hmm. no matter who it is, really. Because it's up to you. You have to live with this script, you know? And then you have to do it again. <laughs> you have to <laughs> live with this script. I mean, no, it's, but it's true. It's, you know, and, and you, what, what might strike us about your script might be totally different than what you like about it, you know? On the other hand, if you hear the same, you know, I think of it like in terms of doing stand-up, like you might have a joke that you love, if you perform it three times to three different audiences and it doesn't get a laugh, my opinion is you're wrong about that joke and you should not do it anymore or, you know, you should be willing to accept the fact that it's going to cost you, you know. Uh, so I think you, you want to show it to people and get a sense of what do they think about it and what do they think is it needs. And you just keep doing that, you know. And in terms of getting the attention of a manager and agent, I think that can come later. You know, and there are many, many ways to do that. But it's really rare to have a really good script because it's hard, you know. And I think there's some like there's some like notes you're gonna get that are technical that are like like I couldn't track this character or what they were doing, it's confusing. 
And those are notes to like kind of, I think, pay a lot of attention to. And then there are like kind of these larger things that are like, like, are you sure that this is a good topic for uh, getting an agent or something? And just, uh, you know, no one knows that. Yeah, it's impossible to predict like what is like a trendy hot script to have, <laughs> you know? Because yeah. by the time it's clear that, oh, this kind of movie or show is really popular, it's too late to write that as a sample and have it be good because it takes a long time. So there's really no point in chasing that kind of stuff. You just, sometimes you get really lucky and you're like right in the zeitgeist or you happen to have the thing that people are looking for or something that's tonally related to it. And, um, and you know, I mean, we wrote a, a sample like three years ago, not a sample, it was a pilot uh, that was like a comedy about like a young Vladimir Putin you know, at the time, it was like, okay, this is like edgy right on the outside of things. <laughs> and, the war. and then it sort of took a turn like, oh, I don't know about sending this out to people. I, you know, I, we, I think we stand by it as We like, stand as by fine. it, and we <laughs> added that you are an ethnic Ukrainian Yeah, my parents are from page. Kiev, yeah, but, so, so, so I cool. feel fine about it. But, <laughs> fine. you know, that can happen, you know. Yeah. Um, so so, but, so the, you, here you have this spec script, whatever you know, genre. Mm -hmm. What do you do? What do you do with it? <laughs> so you've annoyed all your friends. Yeah, yeah you've said, said to everybody. They've all said, like, this isn't going to work. Should you, like, we are, we are a film school. So mm -hmm. you've graduated and, and uh, everybody knows some filmmakers and producers and sh actors. Should you try to get somebody to make it as, say, a short film or a episode to have it something on film to look at? Or is the value in it still on the page so that I can submit it to agents or friends that I know that might know somebody who knows somebody? I think like if you can make it, maybe think about it. I've definitely had friends who have made their pilots to like kind of varying results, but I think th there are these like pilot competitions at various film festivals and stuff. And mm -hmm. I think actually people making pilots, it's pretty rare to actually go through with it especially if it's like kind of self-produced because it's insanely hard and time consuming and makes everyone really grumpy and you have to call in all your favors and spend a lot of money. So there's not a ton of competition to get into those things and they will get you a little bit of attention, I think, if it goes well. I mean, anything you can do, you know, like a really, f people, agents are always looking, you know, and also mm -hmm. like, I bet you, you may not know any agents or managers, but you'll probably get to know people who are assistants to agents and managers or people who are in the mail room at these agencies those are your those are the you know people who can really help you because they're going to rise as you rise and those are the ones who are like hey take a look at this you know we you know when we got signed we got we were somebody's first clients you know a manager mm -hmm. and i think that that was because we were new writers and so you're looking for a new manager or someone who's about to be a manager and is looking for people. There are all kinds of places they look. People go to stand-up shows all the time. I'm sure they go to wherever sketch and improv is performed. They're looking at, you know, somebody who has like a really funny Twitter account. You know, I know somebody who got hired on um, What We Do in the Shadows because the showrunner of that saw his Twitter account and was like, I think you're very funny and, you know, he got a job off. Now, he probably also had a script, you know, mm -hmm. but that, you know, that's just another way to do it and I, I think there's so many more avenues now than there were you know, even 10 years ago when we mm -hmm. got an agent. What are other other avenues or say, how can writers make money? Is it just television and film? Are there other ways to make money? Oh boy, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Besides um, waiting tables, of course. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I had a like kind of day job for a long time at Court TV, later True TV. But that like opened the door for just like freelancing, kind of punching up reality shows and stuff like voiceover and stuff like that. So there's a lot of like things that are, and I think writing is writing and it was like, you know, even if it's like kind of silly or it's not really your thing, like you still have to craft something the correct way, which is good practice, I think. Um, so I did that for a while. Um, I think there are, you know, you're always looking for, you know, when you list, when you listed all these things we've worked on, I was like, it really sounds like we did more than we've done. But there are huge <laughs> amounts of time in between these things where you're, you're like, 
it's over, you know. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, you do find different, you know, it's not uncommon for people to like do copywriting, I think is like a pretty common gig, you know, for, what is that? for advertisements like oh. TV ads and, mm -hmm. you know, things like that is, is a good job. Because again, you punched up a Spanish language Bud the Light, Bud Light commercial. commercial, yeah, yeah, that friends of ours were making. I, I think that's a good <laughs> do gig. Do you speak Spanish? No. no, they had someone on set who would translate our jokes <laughs> into Spanish. Um, yeah, the little yellow sticky we passed like went through yeah. several different layers. Translations. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's a good job because it keeps you. It's a writing focused job, mm -hmm. um, and you, you know you, you can always do it. And the hours are not so bad that you won't be able to be working on, you know, your script or something like that. Mm -hmm. How, which just reminds me about the whole pandemic. You were working on Zoom mm -hmm. for a very long time, right? The whole first season of the, the, both seasons of Only Murders, we were all a Zoom writer's room. Yeah. yeah. So was that better than working in person or? I think on the whole, way worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you're sitting in front of a computer for eight hours, right? Just I would leave just like with my brain completely fried, like more fried than usual, which right. is, it's, my brain is not in great health in the first place, but. I liked it because um, we were able to have people who were in New York be in, in the Zoom and uh, and they were great, and I don't know that we would have had them, you know, it's tough to ask somebody, move to LA for five months or something. The disadvantages are, especially on a show as serialized as Only Murders, and in a lot of writer's rooms you'll have these whiteboards, you know, and note cards with like, here's what we have so far, here's what we're missing. And those are really helpful to like, I mean, I can only imagine how helpful it would have been on our show, where like, oh. you know, you're looking at it as you're like, kind of listening to people, and you're kind of doing stuff in your head about, yeah. Filling in these gaps. Brain jamming, I call yeah, it. Yeah, brain jamming. <laughs> yeah. And we didn't have that, you know, just because of how the Zoom worked. So I, I think it'll be season three, I think we're talking about. It seems like we'll be in person. So it'll be interesting to see. Well, the, how that like, works. the note cards and the whiteboard are kind of political in a weird way, mm -hmm. in the sense that the showrunner is the one usually with the, you know, the marker or tacking up the note cards. And so you get a really good idea of what is in the showrunner's head, whereas on a Zoom room, you're just like guessing kind of, like you're trying to remember everything he or she seemed to like, or you know, uh, mm -hmm. like what did we talk about yesterday and whatever. What did so, we just talk about? Yeah, what did we just talk about? <laughs> yeah. um, and there's also no cross chatter, which is I think a, a problem in a comedy room. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think our students were feeling the same thing on Zoom of there's no engagement. There's you don't have that human engagement amongst other yeah. people um, that seems Not to... all of us like that. <laughs> 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 well, I won't talk about yeah. <laughs> your feelings yeah. on that. Yeah. Um, what are your favorite shows? Gosh. Well, I was just saying, I was watching the David Simon show that Mateo recommended to me. That's not a comedy, but about the <laughs> gun trace task force in Baltimore. What is it called? Yeah, we own nailed the it. Yeah, we, we own, own the, the city. Yeah, yeah. What is it called? We own the city. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I don't know. You know, I'm not always seeking out, t in terms of comedies, like, it's not something I seek out, but if I, like, a show that I watch, I'm like, wow, this is incredible. It's like what we do in the shadows, I think is is amazing. Yeah, it's always like a loaded experience when you're like, oh, I guess I'm not on the show. <laughs> like, yeah. I would uh, say Hacks, I truly, even though they're our friends, I, I really think is a great show and I'm constantly impressed by what they do and yeah. how they pull it all together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good one too. Um, I don't know. Dave? You watch Dave? I like Dave. I'll watch <laughs> Dave. Know. I'm like asking you. <laughs> I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. It's tough because it's all, also like you're busy writing shows all day and then you know so yeah. I feel like I have a long conversation with my wife every night about what we're gonna watch and then we watch right. five minutes of a documentary and go to sleep that's a little right. portrait of my <laughs> sad little life <laughs> that is not helpful for you guys one bit yeah <laughs> so when you all you've written some pilots that you've sold to various networks what inspires you what what how do you come up with the idea for a pilot? Any any special formula, or is it just very random? Of hey, there's something. Putin's in the news. Let's write something about Putin. Yeah. <laughs> well, that turned out to be the wrong impulse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it just starts with a feeling, and that feeling is, baby, we need money. <laughs> I think you can't wait. You can't necessarily wait around for inspiration. Mm -hmm. You know, it is kind of like, you know, time to go to work. You know, like it's not. There's an aspect to it that I suppose someone else would say is is art. You know, but mm -hmm. I personally just think it's like <laughs> you have to go to work. You know, you have to you have to write. Uh, in terms of our process. I think it does start with like here are some things we've come across that we think are funny or interesting, you know, books or stories from history or magazine articles or, you know, we used to do a thing where we would each right we would each like here's five ideas. Yeah, we'll never do that again. We didn't do that again, but it did give <laughs> yeah. us a list of ideas that if we were like super desperate, we'd look through them yeah. and feel really sad. Yeah, but we'd be like he'd have five, I'd have five, yeah. and then we'd pick like okay, I like those two of yours and those two, and then you kind of whittle it down. You know, other people are just like, all right, t time to write this year's family show or something. Yeah. And I'm, sh you know, th that works for some people, I think. I mean, I had, I, you know, uh, our friend Liz Merriweather, like when she was starting out, she sent me one of those lists mm -hmm. with like 30 of her ideas on it. And like her new girl was on <laughs> the list was like, a girl lives with some guys, <laughs> yeah. you know? Like, and it's just get everything out there. You never know, like, what, however kind of short of an idea or whatever seems like, oh, that's not enough for a show or something. You might come back to it and there might be something really great in there, you know? Yeah, I mean, the Putin one specifically came from uh, TBS had just a blog post that somebody had written that was more or less a short story-ish about somebody who claimed to have known Vladimir Putin in the early 80s when they were students in Paris. You know, there wasn't much beyond what I just said, and they're like, is this a show? And so based on that, we we're like, yeah, I guess it's a show. Here's here's what our <laughs> yeah. version of that would be. And then we found out it wasn't a yeah, show. It's not, it turns out it's not a show. <laughs> but, you know, so that you can Except start with really nothing. Except next year, somebody, one of you, will be writing yeah. that. I'm, you know, be <laughs> you careful. Know, so you just kick stuff around like that, I think. Um, mm. for, sometimes it's your own idea. And sometimes you'll meet with a producer or a company, and they're like, "I've got the. I've always wanted to do something about mm. summer camp. Heat you know? lamps. Heat lamps. Yeah, <laughs> you can do it. Or like, we've got to deal with the heat lamps, people. <laughs> yeah, you know, right. you, is there anything for heat lamps that you've got? <laughs> yeah, you know, and that, that's a way to do it too. It's increasingly there's a lot of people who just like they own stuff. You'll be like, what? And they'll be like, yeah, we own all like. ESPN two like ESPN articles from yeah, 2012 yeah. to 2015. Here's <laughs> one that might be interesting, and you're like, okay. Yeah. And now you're writing something about Albert Pujols or something. I don't know. Yeah. And and I think it took us a while to become open to that. We were like, oh, we want it to just come from us and be 100% our thing. Mm -hmm. And I think what you you know one thing we've learned is is we can bring our sensibility to these ideas that come from somewhere else uh, and and make it as much ours and get as passionate about it as we would if it were one of our own poorly conceived ideas. <laughs> would you rather be sitting around laughing Mendocino Farms lunch uh, or working on your own ideas of shoot, you know, on your own pilots or would you rather be in a writer's room on a, on a staff and forget the money, forget the paycheck. Mm -hmm. What would you, what, but what's the salads are the same? Salads are yeah. exactly the same, mm -hmm. same lunch order. But the money must not be very good. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, we do both. We, we you know, because you're not staffed all year round and you're not, and you can go a long time between staffing, you know. Only Murders is the first time that we have been on a show and come back to the next season because every other show we worked on pretty much has been canceled or they changed the <laughs> this writing is a staff. Good, this is good. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's the most common. I think our experience is the more common one, which is most shows don't stick around. Yeah. And when they do, there's a lot of turnover. Oh, I mean, the first time it happens to you, you're also completely crushed. Right. And I wish someone would have come back from the, you know, to tell <laughs> the you. future? Yeah, from the future. Yeah. Like a Marty McFly, a writer Marty McFly, to tell right. me, like you'll be crushed, but in a very like a much slower, yeah, <laughs> long, yeah. attenuated yeah. way. But so in between those things, we work on our own stuff, you know, uh, which is also really rewarding. It's nice to do both. Like uh, there is something about the social aspect of being in a writer's room 
working on somebody else's show that's, I think, um, good practice, you know? Yeah. And, I, you know, I think I know a lot of people who write by them. You know, feature writers are mostly, it's very solitary. And they're dying to work with other people and be in the right. room. And, you know, so the grass is often greener. And is I it, guess it's good to is it, switch. Do you think it's harder to work alone or as partners? My feeling is that nobody truly works alone, you know. You need people to tell you uh, if it's good, I think. And when you have a partner, it's a much more rewarding experience. And you're, you're, so you're, you're much more honest about what the process is, which is no one does it alone, I think. Uh, and hopefully you, you have somebody uh, who teaches you things. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> They're very cute. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what's, what's one last question. What, what's your dream project? Would each of you have a dream project oh to work God. on? I'm hoping that Putin figures this thing out and <laughs> becomes marketable again. He can come back from this. <laughs> <laughs> We're all going to laugh when this is airing on Hulu. You know, so. I, I think we, we, met, we do find a way generally like ev almost everything we work on, there is a moment in it where we're like, man, it would be so cool to do this yeah. thing, you know, which always is a sign to me that we're, we're writing the right things, you know. So, like, we're going to go pitch a show that there's no point to talk about now because it won't sell and we'll be really sad about it. But <laughs> just today we were talking about it and we're like, man, this would be really fun, you know, yeah. to have our own show and have it be this, like, weird thing that, um, you know, came out of our heads that we're interested in. You know, anything like that, I think, would always be. I think you, like... Or a third Top Gun movie. A third, <laughs> a third one. Um, I think you, like, when you start out, or at least... This was something that I felt. I was like very kind of attached to my like handful of good ideas. If I like the ones that I thought were good at least, and I was like, these are so precious. They like like I have to make these because I'm not going to have any more good ideas. Like I have two good ideas, <laughs> and that's it. That's you it. Know? And I, the longer we've been writing, I think the more like you find that. Oh well, like an idea can come from anywhere, and like mm -hmm. you can love it as much as that thing that you were clutching onto so hard. So, yeah, I guess the next one, I guess whatever whatever we're figuring out is mm -hmm. always the one I want to make. Have you all written anything like you said? The New Girl was on the list. Anything mm -hmm. where you're going? Well, I don't really think this is a great idea, but let's put it out there. Let's see what it is. And the response was great. That was our first pilot, kind of. <laughs> In a way, I mean, we really we didn't loved expect it. it. We really loved it. We thought it was really funny, and we showed it to some friends, and they were like, <clears throat> "It was a, it was a sitcom about working for the presidential campaign of Michael Dukakis," and um, <laughs> and like we thought it was just so funny and a really like interesting area, and it spoke to us, and we showed it to people, and they're like, "Why Michael Dukakis? Like, can it be someone like more recent? Could it be any? Could it?" be any presidential campaign. And we kind of like, we're like, no, it's got to be Michael Dukakis. Come on, right. man. And um, and it ended up being the right decision, I guess, at the end of the day. I think you don't ever really know until you show it to people. Yeah. You know? So um, it's, it's hard to say. I think we've certainly like pitched things, jokes or whatever. You're like, this is it. You know, I'm <laughs> retiring on this one or whatever. And it's crickets, you know. So you just... You can't ever really tell, I think. Yeah. Let me yeah. ask you one last question, and I, I want to open it up to in, any of them. But um, So when you pitch an idea, mm -hmm. people have read it, your managers have read it, your friends have read it, everybody's saying this is a great idea, somebody gets you in the network or mm -hmm. wherever the production company to pitch it. What is the pitch like? Do you all both hell. pitch? <laughs> oh, my God. Absolutely do, you, do you? Is it short? Is it? Do you pitch the whole series idea? You pitch the pilot? It's never short enough. No. <laughs> I, I'm a big believer that it's never short enough. But um, I think, yeah, I don't know. There's lots of people who do lots of different things. There are people who bring in, like, an audio-visual component who really practice it, who get it down. There are people who are just, like, naturally good at 
pitching their ideas and they go in and they just kind of like, they don't have a piece of paper they're working off of. They're just like, hey, how about this? It's a very different skill than writing. I mean, yeah. it's a totally unrelated skill, really. It's so funny that they make like writers who are just like kind of chewed fingernail, nervous, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. downer people <laughs> by nature. They make them do this like Willie Loman routine, <laughs> like <laughs> where they're like, I got a show for you. <laughs> I mean, our process is, we don't tend to, this this has changed over the years, but we don't tend to run our ideas by a lot of people before. Uh, you, you know, you'll kind of, you might run it by a friend in a very casual way, like here's a one sentence, this kind of a thing. And we might run it by a manager or an agent. Sometimes just be like, does anybody else have anything in this world, you know? And then, and really more to just be like, here's, here's our, our ideas that we're interested in trying to develop into shows. Can you try to get us meetings with whoever you think is in the tonally, you know, philosophically is in this kind of space? And then we'll meet with those p these different companies and we'll pitch them, you know, usually two ideas in case they, for whatever reason, hate one of them. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. uh, Don't like that? Well, yeah. you'll hate this. You'll hate this backup <laughs> one that's even less thought out. And, um, and then based on that, you know, they'll be like, yeah, we, we kind of like that. And then you'll kind of like, you know, you maybe only have a two-minute version of the idea at that point, and then you'll kind of flesh it out a little more, a little more. The characters, you know, here's what it's about thematically. Here's what here's what the pilot is, which is really less important in a pitch, and yeah, here's where it'll go, kind of. And that whole thing should be 15 minutes. I mean, it at gets the longest, to a point for us where we like write everything down yes. that we're gonna and then say we just to people. Read that. Yeah. And we we're, we try and get as glassy eyed as possible <laughs> yeah, yeah. as we're reading it, and and just have our voice on a monotone. Yeah, that's the way to sell something. <laughs> and then based on that's what people that's what it pitches is a fifteen minute explanation of your show that should kind of feel like you know you're demonstrating not just what's in the show but what the show is like tonally, hopefully. I think networks and uh, yeah, I think this makes a lot of sense want to know why it's you that is writing this thing. And that's mm -hmm. like important for pitches. We had a pitching class in USC and it was like kind of helpful. I didn't take it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's I did. what went wrong. Yeah. It felt, it was like kind of funny. It was like. <laughs> Do you guys have a pitching class in here? Have you, yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it, it ended up being useful. I was like skeptical because I was like, what is this like, I'm gonna be this Hollywood big dog, like I need to know how to pitch right now. <laughs> yeah. But um, and here you are, and here I am, Hollywood big dog. I think what's <laughs> what, what is helpful about the pitching too is they ask a lot of questions that then you're like, oh, I didn't think of that. I haven't considered that angle, so now I got to go back and put that in. And so your pitch kind of evolves in in that process, hopefully. Um, yeah, it's the important thing is like how how. And why it's you? Like, mm -hmm. like what? So like they want to hear your you voice. You. Your, yeah. Where's your voice in that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why and why? Yeah. Why are you the expert in this topic? Mm -hmm. You know, basically, or what? What? You know, because the understanding is like it's going to be really hard to write this. It's an arduous. They're going to give you tons of notes. You're going to go through a lot of drafts, and then if you get a pilot made, that's going to be hard. And then if you get a series, you know, season order, that's going to be really hard. So, do you have enough passion in this idea? Or is it just like, you know, you're doing this because you need that year's, you know, um, summer house payment? <laughs> Which, again, works for some You have people. a summer yeah. house? No. <laughs> we both own many summer yeah. houses. <laughs> one, depending in which region it's summer, you know, you want to be able to go. One, yeah. one for each. Yeah. Um, do you all have any questions? This is your chance to ask questions that nobody else in the business will probably answer for you. Young lady, I, uh, I wanted to know from your original ideas, your original scripts, how many of them get picked up, and how many are in the drawer right now? <laughs> well, they're currently all in the drawer, <laughs> but you know, there's different stages. Like you know, you might sell a pitch and you know, write the pilot, and then that goes away or you might sell the pitch and like in mid pilot they're like I don't know we need to move on from this you might like get it made and um, like they might have you might make the pilot and then they walk away from it they're not going to make the season I mean that's actually the like all of these stages are way more common than anyone making an original idea it's very rare to be a writer and have your original idea made from an idea that you just have you know 
and we know lots of writers who are extremely successful who've been writing for a really long time who every year come up with an original idea and it's they, they've never made it you know but there's some get made so some do get made <laughs> yeah i mean you shouldn't not do it but <laughs> <laughs> Kind of just follow. Would you say there is like a ratio of how many scripts do you write, and those who get, like one out of how many scripts get picked up? So you mean in TV or just generally? Generally. Well, it's hard. It's a you know, it's a lot. It's a unless you're. I mean, I don't think there's any exception to it. I think like. Even if someone seems like an overnight success or something, there's probably ten things. I think at USC, I remember they said that. Uh, Lawrence Kasdan, who wrote Raiders of the Lost Ark, supposedly wrote 10 or 15 scripts that didn't get made before that one, you know, and I think that was like his first or second. Um, so it, it's a lot, you know, and it's just this mix of luck and is it timely, you know, all, all of these things can, you know, I would say just something. keep yeah. writing. <laughs> Does it semi-valorize a current repugnant <laughs> dictator? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I we you know have a friend who put together an indie movie, which is all kinds of challenging, and uh, the actor that they cast, who made it possible for the movie to get made, died you know before they started shooting. I think so. Like pro now, they have to start all over or something like that. So you know, all you can do is, is keep writing. I think uh, this is more of like a timing and pacing question, but with uh, comedy and drama, which are both prevalent within the show. Uh, mystery is like the one thing keeping it going. So how do you figure out the pacing of like, what's the payoff on certain episodes? Who gets to answer what? And like, because mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how many times I was like, the tie dye guy, you know, and then yeah, you're, yeah. you're going back, but. Answer with no spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> no spoilers. No spoilers of the first season? <laughs> I, okay. A lot of that was just like, you feel your way through it, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, we had a very skeletal structure. I mean, like, like how you would write a movie, almost like, oh, episode five, they have to make this big discovery. Episode eight, this is. It feels like they, like, are never going to get or whatever. Just like very kind of loose ideas of um, the season. Those things changed a million times as we went through it, and it's just. It was just going through it again and again and again and again until we found things that felt like they were right. So also, it's like what you were saying about just be entertaining. You know, I think you're always like, okay, if I'm watching this show, when am I going to start getting bored or feeling like they're wasting my time? You know, with this tie dye guy thing or whatever. <laughs> yeah, like, right. You know, I'm always you know of the mind that like you should just just get the information out. And just churn through story fast because, like, people have a lot of options about what to watch, you know. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, like, mysteries are extremely technical. Like, they should logically work on some level, and they need to sort through information in the right way. Like, you need to propose things to the audience, give some detail of what it is, but not enough that they, it ruins the experience. And you can get really lost in that kind of thing, and maybe all you really just need is like a set piece with some nice costumes yeah. and like a funny bit, you know. And and really, I would say, ninety five percent of what you like about the show is probably John Hoffman, the showrunner. I mean, it's his sensibility, uh, and it's us trying to serve his vision, and he's the one who has like a real sense of like this is what it should feel like tonally and pace wise. And and you know, we make suggestions, and you might steer things and he might take an idea and like it and then change things around it and, and that sort of thing. But, you know, we're just guessing. You know, we <laughs> may have guessed wrong in season two. You'll have to let us know. Uh, what's your, like, physical process of co-writing? Physical process? Mm -hmm. well, I do, love you this. do a lot of push-ups, right? <laughs> I do mainly crunches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, you mean, do they use a typewriter well, or a I computer? Know, like, point gray, Oh, really? Yeah, it seems unsanitary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, like my co-writer, we like have an outline for each scene and we just yeah. take over different scenes. Oh, okay. I think that's a, like a really good question. Like how do you work with a partner or with a collaborator? Um, 
I mean, we have a process that we've honed <laughs> over There's 10 a years. There's real answer coming here for sure, you can tell. Yeah. When you use like. honed, you know it's an answer coming here. Um, I think basically we work on the outlines together um, and someone will have to write it down and that person is usually bummed a little bit to be doing that. <laughs> but um, it helps to for us to like have the big picture ideas kind of in mind as as we work and then we once we're okay on the outline we split it up and write as quickly as possible um, and then go over it together uh, once we're done you split it up meaning you each write your own version of it or you will like divide it in half I think there are yes. people who do it that way too which is really interesting I think is like a cool thing to do is you write two people go away they both write the same scene and they come back and like, well, I like this version of it and we'll put that in and then we'll use my version for this and yeah. whatever. I think one thing we've learned or, or I've learned, I think you've always been good about it, is like the importance of the outline is like can't, can't be overstated, I think. It's, it's kind of the most tedious part of writing, especially comedy because outlines are not particularly funny. You know, you're looking at a kind of technical plan, but... A really good outline can really help you and save you a ton of time, you know, in rewriting afterwards. Do you then go back and punch it up with jokes, or you, that's kind of part of the process? No, I mean sometimes the outline will contain like, oh, the kind of this bit or you know this funny thing can happen. Mm -hmm. We will usually re-outline after we write a draft, and then we'll look at how the outline changed and then change it again, kind of. But that that's mm -hmm. just our way of doing it. Other questions. Uh, but basically, like, so having written on shows like Silicon Valley and Always Sunny and now doing, like, uh, it feels like there's a shift now with, like, half-hour comedies now that are a lot more serialized, where, like, characters grow and change, like, a lot more with stuff like Only Murders or Hacks. Like, how do you balance that with, like, you know, like, wanting to have a show that can feasibly continue into the next season and then picking that up, like, doing the second season of Only Murders, for example, like, picking that up and reestablishing a world that's funny and we can continue. Because I just find sometimes when developing a show, I'll know where the first season's gonna go and then the story kind of ends. Mm -hmm. And knowing that it, trying to develop something that's gonna have longevity across different seasons, I feel like, like how do you, having that experience with those other shows and now with the newer stuff, like how do you kind of manage and balance those things? I think that that's a really good question because I think people are, are figuring it out as it's going on. like. Again, like the, the the technology, the way like TV is distributed and stuff makes like strange, like filters down into actual artistic decisions. And as the seasons have shrunk, the quality has gone up. They have to be better. They have to be like more gripping. You can't just have like fire out some dud episode of your <laughs> sitcom that's just a rip off of like an old Happy Days episode. You know, like like they used to do that kind of stuff. And Jumping the shark. Yeah. yeah. Right. Totally. And like now you actually have to get people coming back. It's it's much more competitive. And I think we were working on Lady Dynamite, uh, which was uh, run by the great Pam Brady, mm -hmm. um, and she, I think, I think she was like, you just, you just got to use all your powder. Like she said something like that. Just like, you don't know if you're getting another season. So you just use everything you possibly can uh, that you think is good. And I think if you've noticed on shows that do this really well, like I think Barry does it really well where they just kind of do things that on a normal show you think would be impossible. Like, I think a normal show would be like, well, the acting teacher can't ever find out that Barry's a hitman or else the show's over because then, whatever, spoiler, sorry. <laughs> get it past aired, it. It aired. It aired. <laughs> Your professionals, yeah. get past it. Uh, anyway, like, they can't ever figure this out. But, you know, just throw, throw it up in the air. Like, what if they figure it out? Like, how do you keep the show going? And um, I, I think there's something really cool about that. It's just kind of like you're spinning plates in a, like a frantic way to keep it entertaining for as long as possible. And you'll, there's always something new that can happen. You know, I think it shows like a huge respect for your audience to be like, we know you've seen a million of these shows. So what we're gonna do is that thing that you know is coming. Like Hacks, I think did this really well in the second season, where it's like, you know, we all know that this this 
she's not going to be able to keep the email from her or whatever. I think a lesser show would... Spoiler, get yeah, past yeah. it, whatever. <laughs> I think a lesser show would waste your time for four episodes or however long and, you know, until this thing that you inevitably know is going to happen happens. By doing it faster, now you're forcing yourself to come up with even more ideas, you know, and surprising your audience even more. Um, but in terms of, like, the, you know, serializing and the growth, you know, I think part of it is, like, you sort of think of them as m mini movies, you know. Certainly Only Murders, John always says, like, he thinks of each season in three acts, you know, so th that's I mean, just that show, approach. at least, each season can have a different murder, I assume, so yeah. you, you always... <laughs> Not giving anything away. Right. <laughs> but it's true. You want the dynamic. I mean, we're, we talk a lot about, like, what is their level of friendship right now? Because they start as strangers, you know? And, and so they can be more suspicious of each other at times in season one than they could be in season two, for example. You know? You're not going to buy it, them yeah. like really thinking, yeah, something bad about each other, about the murder at least, you know? But you can always come up with a new idea if you've given this one away, so. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Well, someone will. Rob yeah. will. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> what else? Other questions? I know it was somebody else's questions. Uh, hello. Um, I have a question about uh, longevity in the <laughs> screenwriting or TV writing specifically. So, for example, you're writing a show, and you don't know whether this season is going to be the last season or you're going to get renewed or whatever. How do you prepare yourself for this transition from the season to another show or to another season of this show? Uh, <laughs> do you have a strategy? <laughs> um, you know, kind of, I guess. <laughs> like when we finish a season, when we're staffed, as we're coming out of the season, you know, at, at the end of it, we just start talking about, well, do we have any ideas? for? Sh is there anything we want to develop? Like we're going to be off if we're back on the show, we'll learn. If the show comes back, like we'll learn about that in a couple of months. There's always some time. So, what what do we wish we like started doing like <laughs> weeks ago that we could right. start now, uh, so that once we're off the show, we'll have something to do with our lives. So, do you know if you're picked up right away when you finish this one season, or you there's a delay? It's, you really don't know usually. Yeah for a while. You're in limbo, not knowing if you have a paycheck coming in. You, you should just assume you don't, you know, <laughs> because it's so rare. I mean, even with Only only Murders, like, people were feeling really good about it, and we did start writing season two, I want to say before season one aired, but it was a sort of unofficial, you know, it could all go away sort of thing. Uh, and, and the reaction of it had been very positive, just in the, you know, executives who'd seen it and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But I think you you know, you just start panicking immediately, <laughs> most people do that, and then you're like, all right, I gotta just find something else, you know, I think is a very common feeling. I mean, even if you, even if the show feels like it's doing well, and you, like, you think you did well in the room, like, you have no idea what kind of pressure the showrunner is under, like, what kind of priorities he has, she has, that are like, um, you know, uh, this, the network wasn't happy with the dramatic elements. They think you need a new drama writer in the room. <laughs> and so, like, you're a nice person, and you wrote well, <laughs> yeah. and everybody yeah. likes you, but, like, now they're, like, they need a new drama writer, and there are three people he can not give a job to who aren't coming back, and let's just spin the dice. Like, we're, right. You don't spin dice, do you? You can. Okay. <laughs> let's say you <laughs> spin some dice. Yeah. yeah. And it could be you, like you could just not be coming back even though you did a, like a totally fine job. Which is what I say every single time <laughs> that we uh, did not get asked back. Yeah, I mean it can be a long time, you know, between shows. I, I, it, this may have changed because there's so many more shows now, you know. Um, and there are so many like smaller short-term gigs and things like that. But yeah, you, you know, the thing with getting staffed is you're sort of, you're, you're hoping that you're, you're the right person for somebody else, you know? Like, you're kind of looking for a winning lottery ticket. You don't have the most control over that. So it's much better to just try writing your own stuff or pitching or whatever where you, you at least have some agency in it, you know? Because staff writing, you're really just, like, hoping to be struck you're by waiting. lightning. You're yeah. waiting, yeah. 
Anything right. else? Can I ask one more uh, kind of follow up yeah. question? So, is this is about uh, the Putin pilot, which to be clear, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let's say f for your personal development, how many scripts, let's say TV, do you aim to write p per year or like per two years? And you think that it's a good number? I think like we do like one or two TV things and a movie thing. Like, I don't know if yeah, we're lucky. That's a lot. I, I mean, I think now, like for you, I would say, I think people's goal was like two scripts a year, two or three coming out of grad school, I think something like that. Yeah. We don't write a lot on spec anymore, you know. Uh, we could definitely write movies on spec. You know, it takes three to four months to write a first draft for us, and then, you know, eight, ten weeks to rewrite. In terms of pilots, we, we pitch, you know, what I said, like that 15, 20 minute pitch thing. If they buy it and then want, you know, will pay us to write it, great. If they don't buy it, we probably wouldn't go ahead and write it, you know, because we need, <laughs> we need to be working. And our feelings were hurt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> now we're doubting ourselves. <laughs> yeah. But I think two or three a year? Yeah. I mean, I Does that sound right to you? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, doable. I think the most important thing is, like, what, yeah, exactly, like, what works for you? Like, if you're a more cautious, like, deliberate writer, like, well, the, it's going to be harder for you, but you should do what you, like, what you think puts you in the best position. Like, obviously, people who write very quickly have an advantage, but that's not everybody, and that's okay if you take your time, you know? Like, you should do that. You shouldn't like rush things out that you don't feel confident in because you're going to be sending it to people, yeah. your mother, mm -hmm. your father, mm -hmm. um, people of that nature, and like you just you, you don't get to send that script again, you know. Right. Mm. Good. Anything else? Any? You have the last question. Hi. Um, I just want to know: uh, Have you got any preference for animation or live action? Um, I think we mostly work in live action, but we have worked in animation, and it's been fun every time we've done it. Um, I mean, I think kind of one of the one of the reasons I'm doing this is The Simpsons, and like I like I wish I could work on something like that for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, especially now, people talk about animation as just like uh, it's just a way to tell the story, you know. Um, rather than its own genre, which is a different way of thinking about it for me now. And, uh, you know, there's stuff you can do, and we've pitched animated shows, and we have one that's long in development and things like that. But, uh, yeah, it's like a whole canvas. I think especially as a writer, if you're not the director, you know, it gives you a level of, um, you know, scale and things to play with that I think make it really interesting. It has its drawbacks, too. It takes, obviously, way, way longer and, you know, but I think it's a real, there's a real renaissance of animation now. So. If you're one of those writers who takes a long time, yeah, animation. you should do animation. <laughs> like I think if, it takes about five years to make an animated film. It's, and you're constantly revising and rewriting. Yeah. You never stop rewriting with animation, which is, I thought was surprising. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Any last questions? <laughs> Yeah, I have sort of a more like overarching emotional question. Like, so okay. when you're you graduated from USC and you have this six months of dread, <laughs> you, yeah. and you called it, and you yeah. talked about like you just have to show up, you just have to go to work. So how do you, when you're experiencing rejection or you don't know where your next paycheck is coming from or your next job, like how do you stay on that path? You know, and in a more daily life way like what is it like to go to work like I wake up at 8 a.m. every day and I make a cup of coffee and I sit down you know what is the kind of nuts and bolts of like how do you continue through that <laughs> I mean well, that's the task I think what you've described is really the challenge it's that's it's more that than who has the best idea yeah mm. you know I think yeah. that's like one of the advantages of writing with a partner is that you're like, what are you doing? Where are you? Well, yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> right. You're, you're like beholden to a it. whole other person and their like dreams and all that stuff, and it's like you, you like you have to sit down because you're gonna fuck up someone else's life. This only works if you have extremely low self-esteem. <laughs> so if you're one of those people, 
Get a partner, yeah. I'd say. Yeah. I mean, I like coffee. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I would think that is the hardest part of writing. You know, they say acting is a is a difficult career, but but there are some it, in many ways you, there's a place to go to do it. Um, with writing, it seems like you've got to make yourself. You've just got to make yourself do it. Nobody's making you, right. who's telling you to do it, other than your partner. I think it's also important to know that it's hard for everyone, you know? Mm -hmm. And we've been in a lot of writers' rooms. We've worked with a lot of people who are like brilliant, like geniuses. Very few savants who just like, yes, who are just like <laughs> out of the box at, you know, 22 or whatever had it all figured out, you know? Everybody makes crap, everybody struggles, everybody has to do it a few times, you know? You know, whoever you're, you know, Chris Rock bombs a lot, you know, before he has an hour of comedy that's great. So I think keeping that in mind should help maybe, <laughs> you know? I mean, my, my favorite writer, uh, uh, this guy Robert Caro, who's like 85 years old and just writes books about Lyndon Johnson. He gets up, you know, I remember reading his process as he like puts on a suit and, you know, puts on like a jacket, goes to his office, sits at his typewriter and tries to write 500 words a day or something. And that's been his process. And I was like, well, I don't want to do that, but, uh, you know, I'll put on sweatpants. And, uh, yeah. I think like, I don't know, something that was good for me was... You know, when I was doing sketch and, and that, that kind of stuff, like, I could see my, st like, you'd shoot videos or something and you'd show them in front of an audience and you could see your stuff, like, get laughs, like, be successful, I, bomb, like, bomb, that was the worst, like, gutting. But, like, I just remember during the hardest parts and continually, like, even today, like, what I hold on to is the feeling of watching something that I've written succeed in front of other people, like get laughs, like have people trying to guess what's happening, oh, being surprised, like having that feeling and like is, is something that you can really like power you through some of the most difficult moments. So I guess that's an argument for actually making stuff and, you yeah. know, and I getting don't think, to see it. I don't think you should wait for the insecurity to go away. Because it may never go away, you know? I mean, Steve Martin talks about, you know, they weren't sure. They're like, do we think people like the show? They were shocked, you know? Like, and, you know, who, who has more of a guarantee of success than those guys? And I think they still, you know, are surprised by the reaction and things like that. So that was really instructive, too, to hear, I think, for us. Not me. I, I thought no, we crushed it. I bet it all on the show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, thank you, you guys. Thank you for being such a great audience and wonderful questions. And Rob and Mateo, thank you for being brilliant and funny. As sure. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Good luck to you guys, yes.